some of you are here. I mean, you know you're looking for a preacher. Some of you here know you've been in this situation now for some time. Some of you here just thought you want to see what that crazy old man all the sissy bites got to say. <laughs> I hope that you get a blessing out of the message that God has given me today. And I hope you'll listen closely to what he has to say. If you're turning your Bibles to Matthew 16, as you're turning, uh, I want to share with you a story that probably a lot of you have already heard. But it's worth repeating. Young couple, years ago, just got married. And they were having their first Sunday meal. This was back in the days when traditionally families went to church. They got to church, they had probably the nicest meal of the week. And they were preparing this meal. The wife's going to cook a pie crust. <coughs> and she immediately proceeded to take a sharp knife and cut the end off the pie crust. Her new husband, new married husband, asked her, Why are you doing that? She said, Well, that's the way you cook a pie crust. I'll never remember about seeing Mama do that. That's just the way you cut the pie crust. So, a few weeks later, went by, and you went to visit the in laws. They get to the in laws, and the question come up. My new wife, whenever she cooks a roast, she cuts the end off of it. Bob, I never saw you do that before. to grand-in-law for that. And Grandma speaks up and says, Honey, says, when me and your grandpa just got married, we couldn't afford anything to look pot like this and we had to cut the end off to get it in the pot. <laughs> so here's three generations cutting in off the pot roast. And only one of them knows why. The other two out of tradition. You see, that what's, that's what happens in churches, places of worship today. And it's not just today. It's what's happened in places of worship for thousands of years. True. We get used to things. We get comfortable with things. We do things and we really don't know why we're doing it. Jesus gave a, a lot of answers to a lot of questions about why and why not. So if you find Matthew 16, follow with me. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when he comes, and he said, it will be fair weather, for the day is, for the sky is red. And in the morning today will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign, but nothing will be given yet except the sign of John. Jesus in the left hand went away. The scribes and Pharisees are basically telling Jesus, we'll believe you if you show us a sign. Okay? Jesus' Jesus's response was, I'm not going to be your court jester. 
I'm not going to be your entertainer. You've seen the signs. You've seen the miracles take place. You've been in the presence of me, my word, and my disciples. And yet now you want to sign before you believe in me. You see, the purpose of this message today, and this is just a start, is really for those people who are going to be on the selection committee. On the people that are looking for Westside's new pastor. Because God will guide you if you'll simply listen to him and pray and study his word. He went on to say to the disciples, read with me a little further, when they were when they went across the lake, the disciples got to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now in Luke's rendition, oh, excuse me, in Mark's rendition of this, he also added, added the Herodians. The influence of outside forces. They discussed this among themselves and said, it is because we didn't bring bread. Aware of the discussion, Jesus asked, you of little faith, are you taking among yourself, talking among yourselves about no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls were gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000, and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking to you about the bread, but be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then they understood that he was not telling them to be on guard against the yeast used in the bread, but against the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I want to share little point we did that some of you I'm sure already know. The Sadducees and the Pharisees made up the council that governed Israel, that governed Jerusalem. Each little city had their, their government set up. And this not only covered the outside workings of the city, but it covered the temple and the uh, synagogue, wherever they worshipped. These people were the ruling people, the ruling council. Okay? The Sadducees, if you will accept this, if you will study and read the scripture, the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in the prophets. Basically didn't believe in miracles. All they believed in was the law. Okay? I don't know, but I think that puts in the same line with atheists today. Now you may not agree with me, and nobody, I'm not going to tell anybody here you have to agree with me on any point. But if you don't believe in the power of an Almighty God, if you don't believe in His capacity to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done, then you must not even believe He exists. That was the Sadducees. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were believing people. They believed in God. They believed in the prophets. They believed in miracles. They believed that there would be an afterlife. They believed the Messiah was coming. But this group together ruled everything, including the church. And sometimes they changed the church to make it suit their wants and desires. The best example I can think of, Caiaphas, who was a high priest who had Jesus turned over to Pontius Pilate for crucifixion, was in charge of the temple, but he was a Sadducee. They had put an atheist in charge of their worship of God. 
like others. Verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus in the Bible. The Bible asked him. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'll put your stuff together. Verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Keep in mind, this is probably about a third of the way through his ministry. Not all the way through, but enough it happened. Uh, the disciples had joined him for various and sundry reasons. Andrew followed him because John had said, the Lamb of God. There you go, Andrew followed. Peter followed because Andrew was Peter's brother and says, Come on, we found the Messiah. You need to go with us. You know? Nathaniel, he was under the trees and he didn't get anything good to come out of Nazareth. And then Jesus called him by name and he said, How do you know my name? He said, Well, I saw you up there under the tree. And immediately the thing was converted. This miraculous thing. Now Jesus is asking the disciples, Who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am that he is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by, by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. I've never understood that. If there's anybody here who understand, understand why he begged them so often, so often when Jesus did a miracle, he would tell the recipient of the miracle, don't tell anyone, be quiet. Was he actually being the expert on human nature that he is, knowing that when he told them that, I would make a boy out to go tell everybody? Or did he seriously mean for not to tell anybody? Whenever Jesus approached a person who was demon-possessed, the demon always knew who he was. The person may not, but the demon inside did. Peter had come to that realization, and I'm sure all the rest of the disciples did too. You are the Son of God. You're the Messiah. You're the one that was promised. For all these years, we've been expecting this promise to be fulfilled. You, Jesus, Fulfill that promise. Now we're in your presence. But then this happened. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Peter took him aside. And began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have to find the things of God, but the things of men. 
if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory and his angels, and then all will be rewarded to each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in this kingdom. So this man, Peter, who had just declared Jesus to be the Son of God, the Savior, the Messiah, When Jesus tells him what must happen, he immediately argues with God. Who do you think is going to win an argument when you get in an argument with God? <laughs> get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't condemning Peter. He was condemning Peter's spirit at the moment because Peter didn't understand. So many times, Things happen in our lives we don't understand. We think we're going to accomplish something by doing something, and it backfires if we don't understand. This is religion. This is religion. James defines religion. It is pleasing and acceptable, acceptable to God. Is caring for orphans and widows, and not allowing yourself be, to be polluted by the world. That's how James defines religion, and that's how God wants us to practice religion. But the world, the world looks at religion, and I, I'm sure you've heard this analogy before. Religion is man's way of reaching out to God. Jesus is God's way of reaching out to man. Amen. Peter was doing the best he knew how to do when he rebuked Jesus because he couldn't understand if we just got the greatest gift we'll ever have, why are we going to have to give it up? And like so many of us, Peter didn't listen to everything that Jesus said. He just listened to what he wanted to hear. As soon as he heard Jesus was going to die, he wouldn't listen. He didn't hear about the part where Jesus said he's going to come back to life. He missed that part. Jesus had to rebuke him. Turn with me to chapter 23. And I got to, if you look on the back of your book, you've got just scriptures I had planned to use today. They may be some more, they may not be. But in chapter 23, Jesus really runs into the religious of the day. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees said in Moses' seat, So you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do, do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on, men, on men's backs, shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplace and have men call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master. 
and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. <clears throat> I've shared with my class, and I've shared with some of you outside of the class. I used to be proud to call myself teacher, but this teaching has taught me, man, maybe not so proud. I'd rather refer to myself as lead student. Because the class does teach me, if you've not been in my Sunday school class, and I invite you uh, men, it's a men's class, but you men that may not have been in there, come visit with us and, and see what it's like. It's an opportunity for everyone to examine the scriptures and everyone to share with the group what the scriptures are <coughs> giving us an individual. And it's a learning process. Jesus tells the crowd, doesn't tell them to quit going to the Son of God. He doesn't tell them to do that. He says, just don't do what the leaders do. Because the leaders will lead you wrong. Now here I am a leader in a Baptist church, and I'm telling you that. But the, the fact is, the leaders probably won't do you wrong because they intend to. See, they're still trimming the end off of that roast. <coughs> they don't know any better. In the last week, I've been asked about Lynn. A tradition that has been started by men. And this is no disrespect to those of you that may think Lent's the thing. But I'm telling you, the Word doesn't say anything about it. Should we be doing it? For years, I'll, I'll confess this. My confession, well, one of my few confessions. For years in this church, at Easter time, that was the tradition. When Pastor said he is risen, what do you mean, say? He is risen indeed. And I would. You know why I would? Because I'm reading this this version right here, which is the New National Version. It does in King James. But it's been so many years since I read King James that I just, I forgot. And I talk to everybody here, everybody, everybody never hears me talk. Read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. What you going to read? There's only so much, what you read through, what do you do? Read it again. Why? Because you forget stuff. Why? Because sometimes God will show you something this time through that He didn't show you the last time through. Amen. So don't give up on reading the Scripture. Now that I looked and found it in King James, I don't have any problem with that. That's that's the tradition of the Bible, not a tradition of me. Amen. But see, we get caught up in so many things that we miss out on what Christ intended. You who are on the search committee, I would encourage you to find, this is me, I would encourage you to find a well-educated person, a man, 
Because the Bible says a pastor should be a husband and one wife. And I ain't known any gender issues in this church, and I hope I never see them. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're confused about what your gender is, come see me after service and we'll have a talk. Okay? So we're looking for a well-educated man. But not necessarily a snare. Uh, Seminary student. Now, from time to time, you hear words come out about the seminary students come from schools that have turned atheist teachers. And I'm going to tell you, the Ivy League schools in the United States, Harvard, Yale, all those type of schools, started out as seminaries. Some of them, I don't even know if you can take a Bible into them anymore. I can't give you a statistic on the percentage of atheist teachers in the seminaries. But we know that. And an atheist can probably teach you Man, without a real problem. But some other stuff I really have some questions about. In my search on seminaries, I found this, and I will share with you. This is not in the Bible. This is the internet, and we know everything it is not always true. But I think this is probably close. Some institutions require their students to sign an elaborate doctrinal statement, which may not even be fully understood by the seminary. Before the student graduates and before his theological convictions are matured, he is immediately straightjacketed into the seminary's practical or particular doctrinal system even to the point of having to agree to a secondary theological issue such as pre-tribulationism or the 24-hour six-day creation view. If he deviates from the doctrinal statement, he is usually suspect by the academic staff, academic staff or in some cases dismissed from the school. But why is this necessary, particularly on non-essential matters. The theological student must, to some extent, be permitted the freedom to do his own thinking and must be allowed to come to his own conclusions. John 8, 31, 32. King James Version. No, I just can't keep the NIV Version straight in my head. If you continue my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But we're telling students in the seminary that they really can't practice that. Not we, but the seminary, the people running the seminaries. Some of the seminaries that are being taught right now are not giving the students the freedom to consult God in Christ for instruction. You got to marry into this system or you can't even get into the system at all. You got to agree to this or just you know we're not going to have anything to do with it. That's a seminary. We need a well educated person. We need a person, a godly person that's going to read the Bible, that's going to continue to read the Bible. It's going to seek God for his interpretation of the Bible. It's going to seek the fellowship of like-minded thinkers. You know, Hebrews, I think, 10, 25, talks about that uh, we're not to forsake fellowship among believers. This morning, that Sunday school class I was talking about a few minutes ago, the term iron sharpens iron came up. Proverbs 27, 17. Okay? Okay. 
sharp, the iron sharper and iron and iron doesn't come in contact with iron. We've got to come together. We've got to discuss the Word of God. We've got to gain a mutual understanding of the Word of God. And we've got to have a man standing in this pulpit on a weekly basis that's willing to teach and preach and promote that understanding. So I picked on the seminary, let's pick on the best. I are the ones who I can talk about. <laughs> Come on, let me cite what I'm saying. But there's more than one. It's just like me bringing up Lynn a while ago. There's more than one. You know, some people think that some people would have come in here today if I hadn't had them to tie their turn and walk out. Sorry, that's just the way that is. Some people would have come in to see me with a tie and turn around and walk out. Why? They hadn't heard what I've had to say. They don't know what I'm going to say. They, they prejudice themselves against me based on something superficial that doesn't amount to anybody. I have in my hands here a document that I downloaded off the internet, but this same document was used here at this church a few months ago, about a year or two ago. It's an analysis seminary student, a seminary preacher. He studied under Gamaliel, who was the most renowned Bible teacher of his day. Paul had religion and thought Jesus was wrong and Christianity was a cult. And he was going to straighten out the whole world and he was going to get them all, put them in jail, and have executed. All the Christians. And then one day, he decided he was going to get him some papers and go to Damascus and arrest all the believers in Damascus. Hard way that is behind in life. <coughs> oh, y'all know the story. I think probably if you don't, again, it's in the end. Go to 1 Corinthians 12. And this is a chapter that uh, a lot of Baptists get nervous about. But we all accept Paul as being a great teacher. I don't think there's a better authority ever lived on this planet besides Paul, other than Jesus himself. Paul knew the Old Testament scripture, the law. Paul was taught by the Holy Spirit from the time he had the experience on the road to Damascus until his death. All his ministry, he wrote a third of the New Testament. And if you found 1 Corinthians, uh, we'll start verse 1. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now, how many did I say? 28? 28 years here. <coughs> do you think there's any spiritual gifts in the Apostle Paul at the time of this writing? With any spiritual gifts that existed, he called it nobody. When Paul goes so far as to make a statement concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You think he would lift any out? So let's read the list. Uh, starting. 
in verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one that is given through the Spirit, the message of wisdom. That's one. To another, the message of knowledge. That's two. By means of the same Spirit, to another, faith. By the same Spirit, another, gifts of healing. By one Spirit, that one Spirit to another, the miraculous powers. Miraculous powers now. Keep that in mind. To another, prophecy. To another, to another distinguishing between the spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. To still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he gives them to each one. Just as he determines. By my count there's only nine there. Now, some of these listed with Roger Bosch here for years as music minister. Not Mike and John, I know. Roger is one of the finest piano players I've ever heard. Amen. His ability to play the piano is not a spiritual gift, it's something he's learned. God may have blessed him in that learning, but it is not a spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts are given by God when they're needed to bring glory to his name. Amen. They may be given to a person only once in a lifetime, that one gift one time. I'll give the testimony right now, and I, I'm almost out of time. I'll give the testimony right now. 20, 30 years ago, I was on a mission trip, non denominational mission. That's the reason y'all get so much stuff from me because I, 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 if they believe in Jesus, I'll talk to them. I don't care what they, what they call themselves. If they believe in Jesus, I'll talk to them. Amen. Amen. We had gone into an infirmary in Jamaica. And that's all I'll call it. They didn't even have glass in the one, so they just opened it in the, in the wall. And I'm sure all of you at one time or another have seen someone who is blind. Someone like Paul describes, the Bible describes Paul as being blind. You see the white milky lenses that they can't possibly see through. They, they, they just, that's a coding thing. We had ministered to several people in that infirmary. There was a group of about eight of us. I was the least qualified of the group. We walked in the room. Someone had a little bottle of oil. They anointed the man with oil, he was blind, both eyes, couldn't see his squat. We all prayed. And if you read on Paul's writings there, some prayed in the spirit or in tongues, if you will. I did. I mean, I did. But there was some praying. And I really don't know how long we were in the room. And when we got through, everybody said, Amen. And we started out praying. But they hadn't noticed anything. Then I realized I was the last one out the door to door standing up. And I turned around and closed the door. And I looked at the man in the eyes. clouds 
statement is to fight your doctor's statement. I've been studying now for 34 years. That's the only time I ever tried that. I'm not saying I won't see it again. But we need to understand that we need a man who is going to come in here not be hindered by yes. and things that we just do because we don't know what we're going to do. What, what else do they do? What we do? Not worried about cutting the end off the top of it. We'll be trying to teach you this way. Amen. See, a Quran is not a Quran, it's not an Arabic. You've got to conform to Arabic. You've got to learn Arabic to read up and read the Quran. They tell you, I mean, they, yeah, there's some American translations, some English translations. But the Muslim will tell you, if it's not an Arabic, it's not a Quran. Jesus told the disciples, go ye therefore and teach all nations. This thing of tongues. When the Holy Spirit fell on the upper room, and Peter started preaching, before he started preaching, everybody there understood everybody else. Now, this hadn't taken place since the Tower of Babel when God confused everybody's language. Now, he just reversed it. Everybody understands everybody. How could that be? He wanted that they went out and went to school and learned another language. It was a meeting that God allowed them to communicate with one another. The changes that have been taking place in this book is so that we can understand the will of God. Now, I'm talking about Bible. I'm not talking about paraphrases. There's some books out there that have gotten so far away from the Word that God knows. But if you're talking about the King James Version, you're talking about the NIV Version, if you're talking uh, that we've got some new translations here, here in the church, they're trying to convey God's will to you. Somebody changed uh, a thee to a you. That's no big deal. You know, if I talk to him, in fact, that's one thing that used to keep people out of church. They couldn't understand what people in church were saying because they tried to say I'm so holy and righteous speaking in the King James Version. What are you talking about? Okay? So God's made it available to us. The question is, have you succeeded? Jesus says, if you continue my work, That same Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself and take you up to the cross today. <coughs> There's people in bed right now. Lot of Sundays that I wouldn't come to church. We went up by ourselves when I woke up. Sometimes you see a piece of chocolate cake and you're supposed to be on a diet. You've got to deny yourself. But that's not as important as important as taking up that cross. Because when you take up that cross, you show to the world that you believe in a Savior that can save. Amen. You believe in a 
saved you, but you came back to life after dying on that cross. And he promised you a place with him in eternity. There's probably someone sitting here today who maybe knows that I would like to commit that to this brother Harry. Maybe they would rather continue doing things the way they've always done them. And not even knowing why they're doing them. So I know there's at least one man in this congregation who shared this with me often. His biggest concern is eternal security. We all know these bodies give out. They play out. We die. Some of us are going to be buried. Some of us are going to be cremated. Some people have to feel about, well, you can't be cremated. Why not? If God created you from the dust of earth. Start with, he bring you back to the No problem there. But we'll have, there will be a life after this body ceases to exist. Amen. Where are you going to be? Where are you going to be? You know, it's very simplistic. And, but I just came to the realization of this statement last week in talking to somebody about talking about scripture. The person was worried about that had that they'd strain a relationship with their family if they accepted Jesus. And you may. In fact, those of you that like me that were adults when you accepted Jesus, uh, almost as soon as you accepted Jesus, within a few weeks, the friends you had just sort of went away and you start making new friends. Friends that believe like you do. And somebody in a class was upset about that. And I thought about it and I prayed about it. And it, 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 it. Look, there is a hell. Mm -hmm. You better believe it exists. And all you got to do is go there, man. You can sit down and live your life any way you want to. You can never accept Jesus. You can say you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, but never actually have you made him your Lord and your Savior. And you give a free ride to hell. For eternity. That's scripture in James. About every good and perfect gift. It comes down from above. He's giving you those gifts right now. That's how we have the life we have. There is no God in hell. Those gifts don't exist there. In heaven, abundance. No more tears, no more sorrows. I'm not going to do like y'all were used to being done around here. Y'all were used to having the pastor bless his heart, I love him, and he'd bow your head and, and say this, and then, no, no. Jesus went to the cross for you. Jesus died on the cross for you. Now, whether you accept it or not, that, that's up to you. But Jesus died on the cross for you. I'm going to ask you, is the same standing? The only time you ever hear about anybody approaching Jesus in the dark in the Bible was about Nicodemus. You know why Nicodemus went to see Jesus in the dark? 
because he was afraid of religion. He was afraid of the scribes and the Pharisees knew he was talking to Jesus. They kicked him out of the Son of God. Mm -hmm. You get on the back of uh, uh, books and you got notes there that says something about John 9, I think 20, 24, 20 through 24. I didn't even go through that scripture today. This is a parish of the blind man that Jesus had healed. Now they knew Jesus healed this man. They knew he'd been blind all his life. But when the council came, when the scribes and Pharisees came and questioned them about who healed your son, well, he's of age, uh, ask him. Why? They were fearful of the blood eye of the Son of God. That's what religion does. Don't be fearful of being put out of here. Jesus will take care of that. You need to be put out of here. I'm not going to put you out. John's not going to put you out of here. We want to welcome you. But you, if you never stood up to Jesus Christ, and you want to have an everlasting relationship with Jesus Christ, there's no promise of tomorrow. Almost all of us get in a vehicle and leave this place. We may not make it home. John's going to, I hope, come up here and leave us on a song and invitation. And while he's doing that, if you need to make a commitment, make a commitment. But don't be bashful about it. As soon as you step out and ask to this aisle, believe it, this is the way I did. Nobody made it easy. I had to step out in the aisle, but as soon as you step into this aisle, the Spirit of God meets you. Amen. You'll suddenly have courage you never dreamed you'd have. Come on. Come on forward. We'll pray with you. We'll counsel with you. We'll try to give you what you need. But I can't give you what you need. The Holy Spirit can, and He will, if you acknowledge Jesus. Maybe it's not salvation you need. Maybe it's repentance. Maybe you felt like you were saved and you used to live in a lifestyle that you're not quite so sure anymore. Be sure today before you leave this place. You're in the church council. You're on the search committee. Don't let seminary or Southern Baptist Dictate who you choose. Let Christ dictate who you choose. Amen. And only Christ. I bet you now, rise as he's John can start singing. Y'all stand and be one.